a monthly show based here on the Second Life Book Club Island here in Second Life. We broadcast live from here on Facebook and YouTube every third Monday of the month at 6 p.m. Second Life time or Pacific time for you folks in real life. We meet history authors and others from the publishing world to talk about books and the issues facing them today from social and technological change. And there's certainly a lot of that going on. I'd like to thank Drax of the Prey, host of the Second Life Book Club and the Drax Files Radio Hour, both broadcast from Second Life, for his sponsorship and the use of the Book Club Island. I'd also like to thank Strawberry Linden and Brett Linden for their help in setting the show up. And finally, my eternal thanks to Becky Hansen and Isabel Charon for all their technical assistance in making this happen. Without you, it wouldn't have been possible. A special thanks to Isabel, who's getting up at 1 o'clock her time, no blighty, to run the camera. Allow me to introduce this evening's guest, Keith R.A. DiCandido, who is the co-author of Avenal, a psychological thriller which was just released this month. Keith, welcome to our broadcast. Thank you. Um, I, I have to say on this solemn occasion that I must say that my last name is actually pronounced DiCandido, but that's Sorry. okay. That's okay. Everybody gets it wrong. I, we, I, it, this it, is it, what it, happens, you know, you got an Irish guy born in Brooklyn, <laughs> married to a Japanese wife, you know, I'm sorry. So, so the Italian names are, are just asking for trouble, yes. It, it, it took me a while, but I'll get it right, I promise you. Nope. So, how, how, do you how do you like Second Life so far? Uh, it's, it's nice, I love the room. The the, the the wood paneling and the piles of books. And Yeah, they had a great group of... Uh, yeah, this is, this is a beautiful set. Yeah, and it certainly beats the old Brady Bunch on Zoom, doesn't it? Yes. Although, although I, you know, at this point, the Brady Bunch on Zoom is pretty much what I'm used to. But... Uh, I know. We, we, we all are. It's nice to have a little break. Yeah. So, uh, why don't we get started? And maybe we could begin by you're telling us about your, your journey into writing, your books, your background. Uh, well, I was, um, I was born in New York City, specifically in the Bronx, uh, to a, a, a pack of feral librarians. Um, no, seriously, my, my parents were librarians. Uh, still, well, they're, they're retired now, but... Um, uh, and uh, so I grew up with reading and with books, uh, and and in, and and also in particular with science fiction because my parents are also science fiction, and most most of my fiction and and my work has been in the science fiction and fantasy genre. Um, the uh, and and so I grew up uh, with a steady diet. Once I was able to read on my own, I was reading things like The Hobbit and uh, the Earthsea trilogy. And uh, Robert Heinlein's YA books, and also the works of P.G. Woodhouse, which is pretty much me in a nutshell, right there. So, um, and I always wanted to write. Um, the first thing I wrote was when I was six. Uh, it was this little book I put together on construction paper at summer camp called "Reflections in My Mirror." Um, it, it's absolutely terrible because um, you know I was six. But um, yeah, yeah, but you got to start somewhere. And, and, and that's the, um, I still have that, by the way, I keep it around just to sort of keep myself humble. <laughs> you, you, you know, you, you never know when, when, yeah. you're, when you're rich and famous, that's going to be the kind of thing that, you know, they'll probably sell for millions of dollars at some of these. Oh God, I hope not. The, <laughs> but I, I, I can I always wrote, uh, in high school, I started writing for, uh, the school newspaper and for what laughingly passed for a literary magazine um and then in college i worked on the paper that, that was what it was called I, I went to fordham university uh class of 1990 go rams mm -hmm. and uh the paper i worked on was called and still is called the paper it was the alternative uh newspaper on campus uh and i did a lot of writing and also editing for them and that led to me uh getting a job as an editor first at library journal magazine and then later, uh, working for the late Byron Price, uh, who was a book packager. And uh, eventually I started selling fiction, um, short stories here and there, and then a novel, a couple novels in uh, 1998. That was when I went freelance, and I haven't looked back since. I just, I kept, I kept paying me for my writing. <laughs> and, uh, and I've been a full-time freelancer for, it'll be 23 years in May. So, so, so you're uh, you're you're earning your bread by uh, by being a writer, among other things. I mean, I, I writing is the primary uh, source of income, but I also do. Um, I write lots of different things. I write both fiction and nonfiction. 
Uh, I also I'm a martial artist, and I also do teaching. Uh, in cool. the, teach uh, karate to kids. Uh, that's kind of been on hold uh, since the apocalypse started, but uh, I'm hoping to get back to that uh, once, uh, once things go back to something vaguely resembling normal, at least the point where we can gather in large groups again. Um, Hopefully, really soon. Yeah, but um, but I, and I still do so. I'm still doing some tu- some tutoring, uh, one-on-one tutoring uh, in karate, both uh, in person and over Zoom. So, uh, but I just, I mean, the only way to survive as a freelancer is to have a lot of different fingers in a lot of different pies. So I'm writing novels, I'm writing short stories, I'm writing articles for essay collections, and I write a lot actually for Tor.com, which is a pop culture website run by the book publisher Tor, Tor Books. Uh, I write about a bunch of different things there. Um, and uh, and I teach, and I have a Patreon, which which helps pay a couple bills also, where I which is also writing. So there's there's lots of different sources of income, which is the only way to make this work. But, no, I know I, I work with a lot of writers in in real life, and you know, like you, many of them have uh, something else to uh, supplement their their writing income. Uh, very few writers I've met. Actually, earn their income strictly from their from their books. Like you, they got their fingers in many pies. They have a day job, um, and you know, I did an, art, an article for the uh, Mister Writer of America, New York, a couple of years ago, where I was talking about how the average income of writers in America has gone down about fifty percent from about twenty thousand dollars a year to ten thousand dollars a year. That so sounds about right. I'm 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 working just as hard for less money these days. <laughs> Yeah, you're 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 in, you're in very good company. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I'm hearing from uh, from, yeah. from everybody. Uh, for the folks in the audience, I just want to say that uh, you know, Keith here comes by his uh, writing credentials uh, quite honorably. Uh, in my personal opinion, I think the uh, the New York City Public Library system is probably the best one in the world. So if his parents work there, uh, he's got some really good credentials. Uh, hey Keith, could we maybe start talking about your your latest book that you published with uh, Dr. Batra? You mean that, that, that incredibly large cover that's behind me right now? And the very same. <laughs> so, uh, Animal is actually my first thriller. Uh, I've written a lot of science fiction novels and, and a few mysteries as well. And several, actually, uh, I have an entire series that uh, incorporates both genres. This is my first time writing a thriller. Uh, I was put together with Dr. Batra uh, by um, Jonathan Mayberry. Um, Dr. Batra was looking for someone to work with on this book. He had already uh, put it together as a movie treatment and had inter- and had some movie studios interested in it, but he also wanted there to be a novel about it. Uh, and so uh, the the movie producer in question, uh, Tony Eldridge, uh, who produced the uh, Equalizer films with Denzel Washington, among them, uh, Tony put him together with Jonathan. Jonathan couldn't really do it, but Jonathan and I have worked together on dozens of projects and, and we got together and, and then we put the novel together. What the book is about, uh, it's I, I, I've been referring to it as Dexter if it had been put together by PETA. Um, it's it's about a serial killer who goes after people who harm animals. Um, and so so it's it's a case where we've got somebody who is a a killer, a very nasty killer, and and the methods by which he he kills these people are pretty brutal. And, in many cases, but it also, uh, to quote Gilbert and Sullivan from the Mikado, the punishment fits the crime. Um, he, everybody he goes after is somebody who has done harm to animals, and the manner in which he kills them is related to the manner in which they mistreat the question. So, um, as an example, there's one one of the victims is somebody who owns uh, that produces pate, and one of the ways they uh, make the pate better made from duck fat and goose fat is to force feed the ducks and geese uh, to an appalling degree. And then, so what our, our killer does is basically uh, kidnap the CEO force feed him um, mm. to the point where his, his stomach literally explodes. Um, so the uh, that's that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. This is not a book for the weak of heart. I'm kind of curious how you did your research for this book. Um, this, I one of the things I mentioned. I'm the child of librarians. 
I love about writing is doing research. This book almost cured me of that. <laughs> um, the 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 research for this book was was frankly horrifying. Um, it was really uh, just just horrific. Um, the methods by which people mistreat animals still, despite all the efforts of conservationists and animal rights groups, and you know just people who are not horrible, um, is just is just ridiculous. And while things are better than they used to be, that does not mean they are by any stretch of the imagination good. Uh, there are several examples that I reproduce in the book of people who do harm to animals, from big game hunters to uh, poachers who want hunt elephants for their ivory, uh, to people who hunt gorillas for any number of reasons, um, things ranging from gorilla meat to ashtrays. Uh, to people who, you know, uh, animal parks that mistreat uh, killer whales. Uh, the list goes on and on, and every single instance in the book is based on an actual event that happened. No life. Uh, uh, I, you know, it's not often in the show that we get to do a, a public service announcement, but <laughs> I, you know, I think it's important for people to stop and think about what happens to animals out there. Uh, whether they're domesticated in our homes, on farms, or in the wild. And you know, the population, particularly of animals in the wild, is decreasing uh, dramatically. And it seems like every year we're losing thousands of more species because of uh, human encroachment on the planet. And um, well, I certainly am not uh, condoning going out there and, and wiping out <laughs> the, uh, the no, perpetrators. No. But, uh, you know, I. I I think you're, uh, you're you're making a good point here with the uh, as a there's a threat to uh, to our planet. Yeah, and and, and, just... and it's what what's especially what 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 we were trying to go what, what Dr. Basher and I were going for in the book is you know it's it's morally gray. You know, I mean, what what our killer is doing is not a good thing by any stretch of the imagination, but you can see where he's coming from, too. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to feel sorry for his victims, either. Yeah, well, well um, Dexter was a very sympathetic character. Right, right. Um, and, and, and one of the challenges in, in writing this book was, was finding that balance. I didn't, want, I didn't want to make him out to be completely heroic, obviously, mm -hmm. but I didn't want him to be completely villainous, either. Um, and, you know, and because and life isn't that simple anyway, you know, right. it's, it's it's not a black and white issue. I mean, what what is being done to the animals? Yes, that is a black and white issue. But the response to it isn't. Um, and you know, you, you can't lose sight of the fact that things are better than they used to be. Good. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of good work that has been done, particularly by the zoos around the world. Um, the, I'm a member of the Wildlife Conservation Society, which runs all the New York City zoos: the Bronx Zoo, the Queens Zoo, the uh, Prospect Park Zoo, the Central Park Zoo, and the New York Aquarium. Uh, they do amazing work. Same with the American Museum of Natural History. I'm also a member. I was, the, in fact, my longtime membership in both those things is one of the things that attracted me to this project in the first place. And uh, in, in Dr. Batra's case, what got him interested in it, he is, a, as, as you, you know, calling him Dr. Batra, uh, he is a surgeon, uh, primarily a plastic surgeon, but uh, at, while, while he makes his money off of, of people doing elective plastic surgery, uh, he de dedicates a great deal of time and effort into uh, doing it to, to help people who have been uh, victims of various disasters who, who need the plastic surgery to the emergency purposes as well. Um, he, and, and there have been several times where he's traveled abroad because of things like the tsunami in Japan or, or, the, or the earthquake in 2011 in India um, and various other places. And he's seen in his travels the mistreatment of animals, um, and it's and it, it's what got him thinking about this this particular subject and led to him writing this, uh, and then bringing me in to, to work with him on, on turning it into. For folks in the audience, we had hoped to have uh, Dr. Boucher here with uh, Keith this evening. Unfortunately, with his surgery schedule, he obviously said it wouldn't be uh, possible to schedule it. So unfortunately, we don't have him here, but we, we do have Keith. And uh, Keith, maybe you could tell us a little bit more. What's it like to work with a co-author on a book, especially somebody who sounds like you're, you're meeting for the first time? Uh, well, I'm, the funny thing is, we haven't actually met in person yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Uh, and it's, it's having said that, it's far from the first time I've collaborated. My very first short story in 1994 was a collaboration. My first novel in 1998 was a collaboration with someone. Um, I've written, um, I've written with uh, John Gregory Betancourt, with Jose Nieto, with David Mack, with David Sherman, uh, and with Marina France. Um, that's all. <laughs> and, uh, a pretty impressive list. Yeah, um, and in fact, uh, my previous release to Animal was also a collaboration with with David Sherman. The thing is the the. The thing about each of those collaborations is that each one was different from e all of the others. Um, so there's really no single answer to that question. Mm -hmm. um, and every every book is different, and every collaboration is different. Um, it's you know some of the collaborations I've done have been a straight up you know going back and forth and writing different parts, like my Spider-Man novel with Jose Nieto, Venom's Wrath, which came out in 1990. That was my first novel actually. We sat we spent a weekend together working out the plot. In, in graphic detail, detailed outline, which then had to be approved by Marvel. And then once that was approved, we basically went through that outline and, and split up different scenes, like, oh, all right, you write that part, I'll write this part. And then we folded it together, and then we each went over the other's parts of the book. Um, but uh, the other collaboration I did this past year with David Sherman was a science fiction novel. It was actually the third book in a trilogy. Um, I mentioned before I, I was an editor. I've even though I no longer work full time as an editor, I still do it occasionally on a freelance basis. And uh, one of the projects I did were the first two books in David's trilogy, which was a military science fiction trilogy called. Uh, I edited those first two books for a variety of personal and health reasons. David was able, unable to finish book three. Uh, he had written a good, goodly portion of it and had a basic idea of where it was supposed to go. But he just found he, he was unable to finish it. And because I edited those first two books, he asked me to be the editor. So that was a case, unlike, say, with Animal, where I was technically, but I was trying very hard to make it still David's book. So I was writing it in more in his style than my own style. So, you know, people who come to that thinking they're going to get a Keith DeCandido book aren't. So they're going to get a David Sherman book. Um, on the other hand, Animal is much more, at least the line-by-line the, the -line writing is more in my own style, uh, mainly because uh, the story is entirely talked about. Uh, and then we worked on it together after that. You know, I, I did the line-by-line -line writing, and then he went over it with a fine tooth comb. He um, made several changes and suggestions, particularly, particularly the stuff that gets very medical. There are some very... Um, uh, detailed descriptions of, of certain uh, procedures, both both some of the things that uh, the killer does to his victims, as well as some actual medical procedures that happen. Um, and and those 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 are all those are all his. But um, but it was still, I mean, it, the the story, as I said, is entirely his. Um, and and the manuscript, while while I did a lot of the line by line labor, is very much both of us. It, we both contributed equally to it. It's, it's, it's amazing when a doctor writes a, a thriller, the type of detail they put in. Yeah. Uh, I had the good fortune to meet uh, Tess Gerritsen a couple of times, and uh, I read her first book, and uh, there was a lot of detail in there. You could tell she's a doctor. <laughs> it's, it's certainly something, you know, I or, you know, I think the... Your, your, your typical writer who's just writing a mystery or a thriller could supply, but uh, I've noticed that with a couple of other doctors who write mysteries that, uh, you know, they do get into the detail a lot. Um, we so. try not to be too, well, I mean, on the one hand, we try not to be too gross, but we try not to be not too gross either. I mean, part yep. of the point here was to, to have an effect uh, on people. Um, and, and, and as I said, this is, I, I didn't skimp on details of what is done, not only to the killer's victim, but also what these victims have done. Um, it's it's not a pleasant read in a lot of ways, and some of the there's some chapters in there that are were really difficult to write. Yeah. Keith, you've written across multiple genres. Do you, yes. Well, why do you do this? Is it because you enjoy uh, writing different types of uh, material? Is it because it's the nature of the market, or do you just enjoy writing across multiple genres? Do you have a well, preference? I. I I've written across several genres. I mean, I, 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 like I said, this is my first real straight 
well, technically my second straight thriller. I also wrote a, a novella, another collaboration actually with Stephen Saville, uh, called uh, called Thirty. Um, it was about a reporter um, who finds out about uh, something really horrible going on, and, and, and several people try to stop him from writing about it. But um, the uh, I, I I go where the stories are. I, it's it's definitely not market driven. If it was market driven, I'd be I'd be much wealthier right now. Um, but it's I write what I enjoy writing, and I enjoy mysteries. I enjoy science fiction. I enjoy fantasy. I enjoy superhero stories. I've written quite a bit of the superhero genre, which is sort of adjacent to fantasy and stuff. Um, I've I've always been a big fan of mysteries, and uh, and and I like horror. Um, and I've read quite a bit of horror, um, but it's 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 a lot of the same stuff I like to read. Also, um, and I think that has something to do with it. You know, stuff, stuff that I grew up reading and have continued. To read. I also like writing it. Do you, do you find it difficult to switch across genres, or does it come naturally to you? I've had some difficulty with it. Um, actually, the I I've written Doctor Boucher and I have several uh, projects that we're working on. Uh, one of them is a medical thriller that is with our agent right now. Um, that was a lot harder for some reason. Animal I had, I had less trouble with. It was it was a thriller, and and in many ways it's a police procedural, and that's really my one of my favorite uh, subgenres to work in. Uh, I've written police procedurals in the fantasy, science fiction, mystery, and now thriller genre, and ultimately Animal is the main characters. Uh, I mean, it's about the serial killer, but the actual protagonists who, who do most of the stuff in the book are um, two California detectives and an Interpol agent. Um, and that's... I've, I've, I've always enjoyed and always loved writing. Um, so that, that was easier to do. The medical thriller was a bit more of a challenge. And I've done a few other things that have been out of my wheelhouse that, that have proven more difficult. Um, the David Sherman book was was straight up military science fiction, um, which is not my usual genre. Either. So that was that was a challenge. And and I did I also did a uh, <laughs> what what I've referred to as a violent self help book. It was a Star Trek book called The Klingon Art of War, which was written as a text in the Klingon Empire uh, of ten precepts of how to live your life as a proper warrior. I, I have that book. Ah, yes. <laughs> so somewhere in my bookshelves, and I've got bookshelves all over the house that was uh, hugely challenging to write um because it's it's it, it wasn't really fiction you know um and and it was a lot more difficult to to, to write that that's cool that, that, that's but I like cool. the challenge too that's part of the fun oh, it, it is you're, you're like the uh, you're like the the swiss army knights of writers you know you, you, <laughs> you do it all i do anyway um do you ever see yourself in your in your books keith do you are you any of your characters? Oh, sure. Um, the, the, yeah, there are bits of, especially my personality, that, that tend to come through in my characters. Um, some more than others, but uh, the, I, try, I try not to have them be, you know, exact analogs, but, but elements of my personality tend to creep into any of my characters. Well, please don't tell me that you're the protagonist in Animal, and if you are, you can keep it to yourself. Uh, if, if any of them are, it would be, <laughs> ironically, the, 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 actually, no, well, the two, the two California detectives. One is from uh, the Monrovia Police Department, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. The other one's a homicide cop from San Diego. Um, there are elements of me in both of them. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad you're staying on the right side. Mm. Uh, you, you although, mean, there, although, having said that, there, there are, there's, I wouldn't say part of me exactly, but my experiences at least went into the killer because the killer has a martial arts background as well. Mm. And that I've been, I've been studying karate for over 15 years now. I'm a third degree black belt. And Impressive. that those experiences did have an impact on how I wrote the killer also, because that's part of, you know, a, a much more intense, uh, and, and a Chinese martial art rather than a, but, uh, the, the philosophies of that were had an impact on how. Keith, do you have any favorite mystery writers? Probably, um, 
I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Dorothy L. Sayers and and of um, yeah, I grew up reading reading uh, Agatha Christie and I love the Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, but probably my favorite mystery writer is Laurie King. Um, she, you know, both both her in particular her her um, Mary Russell books, Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes, uh, mainly because. There are few writers on this earth who are better than King at completely immersing you in a particular time and place. Um, she she just does an amazing job of that, and I've I'm in awe of her ability to to to, to do that. And her stories are wonderful. I mean, the the Mary Russell. I always hold up the Mary Russell novels as the perfect example of why there's no such thing as a bad idea. There's only bad execution. Um, because the Mary Russell books are a terrible idea. They're a horrible idea. But she makes it work. Um, you know, it's, it's, for those of you who haven't read them, it's about a, a young woman named Mary Russell who meets uh, an old retired Sherlock Holmes uh, who's keeping bees in, in Sussex. And the first book is called The Beekeeper's Apprentice. And Mary Russell is, in her own way, as smart as Sherlock Holmes and winds up becoming his protege. And then eventually they, they fall in love and get married uh, throughout the early days of the 20th century. And part of, part of what's brilliant about the books is how well she recreates the first you know, couple decades of the 20th century. Several locations, not just England, but also uh, other parts of the continent and, and Asia as well. Um, and you know, this, on the face of it, you, know, you tell me that that's what the books are about, and you think, oh my god, that's horrible. But they're brilliant. They're absolutely beautifully, beautifully done. Yes. No. I, I years ago I read a couple of, of her uh, early books, and I love her attention to detail, great yeah. plotting, and you know you're always uh, careful when somebody tries to approach Sherlock Holmes. Any try, as you said, most fail. But I think Laurie King has done an exceptional job. At, uh, oh, I've done her it. Um, I, I I've written two short stories, and I would like to write more. Uh, that take place in modern New York with a young woman named Shirley Holmes and uh, her new friend Jack Watson. Which we can read them. They're they're in they're in two anthologies that uh, uh, Diversion Press uh, published called Baker Street Irregulars. Uh, the first one is called Baker Street Irregulars. The second one is called Baker Street Irregulars. The game is afoot. They were edited by Michael A. Ventrella and Jonathan Mayberry. They are all alternate takes on Holmes and Watson. Um, by by a number of really good authors and they're and they're absolutely delightful and uh, I I really enjoyed writing both those stories which, where I basically updated Conan Doyle stories into uh, which was an interesting challenge because not all of them really can be updated um, the, the elements of the home stories that wouldn't work in a modern setting partly because. Uh, modern policing is so much better than it was in the late 19th century. Part of it is that some of them are based on assumptions that were true in the 19th century and are not true now. Um, that wouldn't work. Um, and a number of other reasons that, that, that make it difficult to uh, update. Hell, even one of the ones that, one of the ones I did, it was called uh, The Six Red Dragons, which was based on The Six Napoleons. And one of the way, one of the reasons why Holmes was able to solve the mystery in the original story is because of just the natural assumption that if you see somebody in England in the 1880s of Italian descent, well, obviously he must be in the mafia. <laughs> um, that thrilled the crap out of me, let me tell you. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I know. There, there, there are certain things that just wouldn't carry over into the no. 21st century or even the 20th century, like the uh, the first. Uh, sorry, no, uh, The Hound of the Baskervilles, where the uh, the antagonist flips out of the newspaper uh, words and sends a, a note to the the client of Holmes. I'm pretty sure this is The Hound of the Baskervilles. Correct me, please, if I'm wrong. So what does um, what is our hero Holmes do? He sends the Baker Street Irregulars out to the local city dump looking for the newspaper that they were clipped out of. And and when I first read it, I'm thinking, what are the odds a bunch of kids scouring the dump are going to find a newspaper? But then again, I guess, guess, you know, in 19th century London, there probably weren't that many, you know, 
dumps like that, and they probably, you know, where the hotels went, everybody probably knew and scavenged. But yeah. you know, I always thought they were stretching a point there with that one. Yeah. Good. What, what's your life as a, as, a, as a reader like, Keith? And how does it affect your life, your life as, a, as a writer? Oh, I don't have nearly as much of a life of a reader these days as I'd like to. I just don't have time. Um, one, of, one of the downsides of being freelance is that I don't commute. And that was when I got all my reading done. <laughs> um, I, and most of the time when I am reading, it's usually stuff I'm doing for research rather than, uh, rather than what I'm, I'm, I'm reading for fun. Uh, so I don't get to read for fun nearly as much as I'd like to. Try to. But it, it doesn't get to happen. Uh, having said that, I love doing the research. The, that's, that's where the fun is. And, yeah. and, and sometimes I have to do things like, like, like for example, um, I'm currently working on the second book in my urban fantasy series. Uh, first thing I had to do before I did that was reread the first book <laughs> just to sort of get the universe back in my head. Um, you know, I always do that whenever I'm doing a story in any of my universes. I have to reread the stories in it just because written so much stuff it's not all easily accessible and i forget stuff and i forget details and I, need- I, I i often wonder how writers do that especially like somebody like jim butcher with his dresden files who's created this elaborate universe i think he's up to 17 books now uh, how, how, how do writers keep it all straight in their heads uh sometimes some people can just do it i mean i and and to some extent i can do it with with some of the stuff but not all of it uh, and I'm not as good at it as I used to be because there's more there's more information in my head and my brain is more feeble than it was when I was younger. Um, uh, I mean, you also you know you just you write stuff down. Um, sometimes fans create wikis for you, which is um, uh, there's and and sometimes you just sit down and just reread the damn things. Like I said, that's 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 your source material anyway. Um, it's the same thing I do when I write. I've written a lot of licensed fiction. I read a lot of Star Trek novels and. Supernatural novels, World of Warcraft novels, various uh, alien novels, stuff based on existing properties. And one of the things I do before I start one of those is watch the material in question. I watch a bunch of Star Trek episodes, or, or with ones that apply. That you know, I can't obviously watch all of Star Trek because that's fifty-four years, but I can at the very least watch the episodes and movies that are relevant to what I'm writing. Um, I wrote novels based on Leverage or Andromeda or Apollo or Farscape, I would sit down and watch everything that was available to me that helps get it in my head. It's all, it's all part of the same continuum. So, so for all the reading, writing, and research you're doing, um, I, I guess this is where your characters come from, or do they, do they come from other places? They come from everywhere. Um, uh, there's I, there, there's nowhere they don't come from. <laughs> um, I, I I like following people and looking at people and watching people and seeing what people do and uh, reading about people and, and there's, there's there's an endless source of of characters just by looking at the world. They reach out to their own audiences as well as the new audience because of the the pandemic and it's affected many writers uh, severely. Uh, in your case, how has it affected you, your writing, your developing your ideas, agents, book promotions? How, how hard is it out there for you? Um, honestly, it hasn't affected it as much as it might have, except, I mean, it, it, it often will have an impact on my ability to focus. <laughs> Uh, which you know, uh, just because there's, it's, it's very, it's much easier to be distracted right now. Um, but in general, it hasn't affected my actual day to day writing that much because it, uh, my routine hasn't really. Um, if anything, I'm, I'm, it, it's improved my ability to sit home and write just because I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'm not even going to. I'm not going out to teach karate classes. I'm not go I am still taking karate classes over Zoom, but I don't have to drive look for a parking space and then do class and then drive home. Uh I just go down to my living room and turn on and run Zoom. Uh which which certainly saves time. The 
the promotion obviously is completely different. I I don't go to and, and it and it has had an impact on not just the ability to promote, but the ability to sell a lot of this, particularly my small press work. Not so much the the stuff that's published by by the New York publishing houses, but I have a lot of stuff that's out with the small press and being able to hand sell books at conventions is a big part of of my sales, mm-hmm. particularly of of the urban fantasy series I mentioned before, as well as my fantasy police procedural series, uh, the Dragon Precinct. Which is sort of a which is a mix of epic fantasy and history, uh, which is which I've got five books in that series and and I, and I I get a lot of people hooked on that series talking to the conventions and I'm not doing that anymore. Um, yeah. and that's that's unfortunate. Um, you know, particularly when you're talking about small press books uh, or even medium things that are not getting into bookstores, that's a big part of of where you can make get people interested in the series. It's, Shoving it under their noses when they see you at a convention. Um, I, having said that, I've done the best I can, and, and there is a certain appeal to events like this where you don't have to travel. Um, and while I miss traveling and seeing people, I don't miss the time it sometimes takes away from my work. The convention weekend usually meant I was going to get no work done because I was too busy. Convention. Now a convention weekend means I just have to take a one-hour break to sit up. Which, but it's not reaching the same number of people. I'm going to be real curious to see what effect this has on conventions going forward, because this has opened up so many possibilities, especially for people who are disabled, for people who don't have the money to travel to a convention, for people who get anxiety in large crowds but still want to be able to go to conventions. This is now an opportunity. We can do hybrid conventions where not only do people go in person, but people can also participate over Skype or Zoom or Google Hangouts or whatever program they decide to use. Um, and I really think that's going to increase the range of what we can do. Short yeah. term, it's, it's, it's frustrating because it's really the only way we can do it, and it's just not... It's, 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 a, it's as good a substitute as we can have right now for in-person, but it is not a complete... Yeah, I, I think you're right there, Keith, about the the hybrid approach in the future. Uh, I sit on the uh, board of directors of the New York chapter of Mystery Writers of America, and we've had to move all of our functions online. Matter of fact, we even had our holiday party last month online. It's actually pretty popular. We had a good time. Um, but we're finding that many of the conferences that were planned for 2021, at least for the first half of the year, they're already going to be virtual if they haven't been canceled. Uh, people are crossing their fingers for the ones that happen in the in the latter part of the year. But we're finding that we can reach out to parts of the region, like we cover in New York, in New York not just uh, the New York area, but Jersey, Connecticut, and uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, West Virginia, which, as you just said, is very difficult for people to get to meetings or to attend events. But we're finding now that we're able to offer customized uh, events for these local markets. This right. is giving us an opportunity uh, to think about what do we do when the pandemic is over? Uh, how do we have these hybrid events, as you put it, where you got a group of people in a room, uh, but you've also got a whole other group of people who are, are dialing in. And we have large communities of writers in places like Buffalo, New York, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, there's a, a community of writers. And we're seeing opportunities now to bring these people in in ways that we couldn't before. So there, there might be some good coming out of this. Somewhere. Oh, I hope so, yeah. You know, the, the other big change that has occurred to writers, uh, Keith, and you know, your career, you know, going back in the early 90s, you kind of were at the tail end of the way we, we used to write and publish books and sell <laughs> them. Uh, you know, Amazon came along, then e-readers came along, and the internet kind of grew up, and you know, I find many writers who are struggling in this this new world. Uh, self-publishing is a lot bigger and more respectable than it used to be. Uh, you know, I can remember years ago, self-publishing was quote unquote vanity press. Yeah. You know, you, you paid to have a bunch of books printed, and you know, you gave them away to your friends, and if you're lucky, somebody who pitied you would buy one. Um, but now there's some writers out there who are making uh, a good living. With, uh, with self-publishing. Uh, 
What, what's your view on what's going on in the publishing world right now as we see Amazon going vertical now with their own publishing imprints? Uh, they're reopening their own bookstores now, if you believe it, or at least they were before the pandemic. Yeah. What, what, what do you think is <laughs> happening out there, and wh where do you think it might go? Uh, I have no idea where it's going to go. I, 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 I know it's not going to go away. I've been, I have been hearing doomsayers saying that the publishing industry is doomed since I started in the publishing business. Uh, they were wrong 30 years ago, and they're wrong now. But um, having said that, it's certainly going to change. Um, it's... Uh, and it's been changing rapidly. Uh, how much, I don't know. Uh, what I think the biggest difference is not so much Amazon or, or e-readers or any of that, although uh, the rise of e-books is certainly a big factor, but I think it's in particular the fact that the technology has improved to the point where you can create and make a book in your house. Um, when I started in this business, you needed to have, be able to, to create, in order to do a cover, you had to cover mechanical, which was done on a piece of cardboard. Um, the, the technology has improved to the point where everything is done electronically. Both the typesetting is done that way, the, the covers are done that way, the printing is done that way. Um, plus, you can do you can do ebooks, and it's not a it's not a niche anymore. It's a it's a, a significant percentage where book sales are more so a lot for the smaller and medium presses than they are for large public bill. So you're seeing yes, it's changing. Um, I don't think it's changing for the worse or for the better. It's just changing. Um, what it is doing is providing more opportunities for writers that weren't there before. Um, it's in particular, I think what, what's happening in publishing is the exact same thing that's happening on television. Um, when, when in up up until basically um, the turn of the of the millennium, television was pretty much the three networks. Well, the four networks. A couple more started in ninety five, but that was it. That was your option. If you wanted to do a TV show, you had to sell it to a network. Um, the in the late eighties and early nineties, you started getting the possibility of syndicated original shows and 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 stuff like that. Um, and then two more networks started, so they became an option. And then suddenly cable stations started having their own original program. And that broke the dam. Suddenly, now the number of ways you can produce a TV show are legion, and there's so many more shows, and so many more different types, because you've got networks that have a much lower standard for success. You don't need to reach the same number of viewers to be a success on, say, TNT or USA or or to be a Hulu original, or to be a Netflix original, too, if you if you want to see on NBC or the CW, um, and yet, and and it, it provides there's so many more different types of TV shows now that are being produced. You're seeing the same thing in book publishing. You're seeing books that wouldn't necessarily be a mass market success that is required to be published by Random House or to be published by Macmillan, but you are you can still create a book that can find a smaller audience and still be successful. And that's fantastic. That gives so many more opportunities to writers. It means writers can find at least that tiny audience, even if it's not the hundreds of thousands that you need to succeed, uh, or even the, even the, the you know, tens of thousands that you need to succeed as a mass market uh, book in a bookstore. But you can reach at least the thousands of people who love your book and want your book and will keep buying your book if you prefer them. Um, so that's all to the good. I mean, it's still difficult. It's still hard to succeed as a writer, which is as it should be. This shouldn't be easy. Um, if it was easy, everybody would do it. But, you know, writing, writing, writing good books is hard. <laughs> and uh, it's... Not everyone's going to succeed at it. You never know what's going to be successful and what isn't. I mean, nobody saw Harry Potter. Nobody saw the Twilight books coming. Nobody saw Patrick O'Brien books coming. You know, whatever. We don't know what the next big thing is going to be. Um, and if we did, we'd all, like I said, we'd all be much richer right now. You know, Keith, I've asked that uh, question to many writers, and you're actually the most hopeful one I've spoken to. Like I said, I have been hearing about the death of publishing since I started in publishing, and it's nonsense. The, uh, yes, it's changing. 
because technology is changing. The, the, the way we do shopping is changing, not just for books, but for everything. Um, and, and both the proliferation of online stories and, frankly, the current apocalypse have both changed, emphasized even more how it's changed. Um, and publishing is just going to adjust to, you know, it has to adjust because life changes and people read. People still do read. You know, um, the, how they read is different from the way they, I mean, now they, they'll read on their phones. Um, you know, or they'll read on their tablets, or they'll read in books, or they'll read in newspapers, or they'll read on their computers. There's all sorts. But it's, it's, there are more different ways you can read, and that's only a good thing. True. True. Keith, we've talked about the, the apocalypse, talked about the technology, and the challenges those present you as a writer. What are the challenges are you facing today as a writer that make your life, you know, more difficult or harder to uh, to be a writer? Well, I'm getting paid less than I used to. <laughs> and that's one for sure. Yeah. Uh, the I mean, much as I mean, when I write a book for a big publisher, I get a decent sized advance. Uh, when I write a small press book, I get no kind of advance, but I start earning royalties right away. But the sales aren't as um, it's the, the money is worse, um, and that's that's not just in writing. That's in a lot of different uh, fields where where the the cost the, the income has not been commensurate with the rise in the cost of living, uh, which is frustrating. The um, I mean, one of the reasons why I started a Patreon, uh, which you can all go support at patreoncom slash uh K R A D. Uh, the link's at my website, which is up in the um, the. One of the reasons why I did that was it's an extra source of income. It's another way, you know, to bring money in. Uh, and you got to keep looking for new ways to bring money in. I'm not making the same money as I was when I was writing four Star Trek novels. Uh, that, and that's that's an unfortunate reality. And just in general, the advances have not gone up. Uh, the people who are writing Star Trek novels now are getting the same advances that I got, you know, for a Star Trek novel 20 years ago. Um but everything else costs more than it did 20 years mm -hmm. ago, with the possible exception of a gallon of gas. And uh, so it's it's rough. Um, you know, that that's why you have to keep finding different ways of making money and, and, and have variety in your toolbox because you don't know what's... I mean, and things just disappear. I had a really good, lucrative game writing gig going that then just stopped. Uh, it was supposed to be a long-term thing, uh, writing a bunch of novellas. Uh, they were going to pay me really well, and in fact, they did pay me well for the stories I actually wrote, but it wound up falling apart. Uh, this happens. Uh, there's all sorts of, you know, it's a very volatile business. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the biggest challenge, is, you know, you don't know what's going to succeed, you don't know what's going to work, uh, I, I tried doing a book that was not quite self-publishing, but as close as makes no never mind, uh, because I was here. This is back in 2011, and I you know I've been hearing about all these people who were hugely successful, and I've got a following. Sure, this will work. It didn't. Work. Um, the book sold decently, but not great, and certainly nowhere near enough to just. I should have tried to publish it with a. Uh, if it didn't sell, then I could have tried that, but I should have I should have gone that way first. But I didn't. Um, and. It's, I mean, it, it, the hardest part is that it remains incredibly difficult. There are more options now, yes, but it's still hard. It's hard to get published, and it's hard, once you get published, to get people to read it. Um, you don't know what's going to succeed. You don't know what's going to work. You don't know whether it's going to be marketed properly. You don't know if, if people are going to care. And... You, you have to develop a thick skin and you have to just keep keep writing more stuff and putting more stuff out there because you know one book isn't gonna one book may turn into your game of thrones or your stack house book or whatever that gets picked up as a tv show or a movie but um, that doesn't you know or your or your dresden files for that matter uh but you you don't know which can be very demoralizing sometimes. <laughs> I, I, I can understand. I can understand. And Keith, commensurate with the changes in the publishing industry and the technology, 
you know, for years now, we're seeing newspapers shut down, <laughs> magazines go away. Uh, the full-time book reviewer, let alone a full-time history thriller book reviewer, is going away of the dodo bird. I think the New York Times is the only one I'm aware of in the United States right now. There might be a couple of others around, but I don't know them. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. How difficult is it to get reviews, and is that game changing where independent bloggers are becoming more important? Well, that's that's becoming the biggest source. Uh, the Times isn't the only source. I mean, you still have Library Journal and Publishers Weekly and Library Journal, the publishing review as well. Um, and there there are some other magazines. But it, yeah, it's it's gotten to the point where that's the the, the notion of the professional critic, uh, or at least the professional book critic, is is um, not what it once was. Um, uh, which which. It's, it's become more crowdsourced, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's not necessarily a good thing either. Um, but that's that's the way things are going. And it's it's at the point where, yes, um, the news that seem to matter most are the ones that are posted on by enthusiasts who are not getting paid. Um, or by people who leave, you know, card reviews on Amazon or, or comments on Goodreads. Uh, I, as somebody who, like, used to write book reviews regularly... <laughs> um, uh, I, I find it a little. Dis I, 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 part of me like winces at the lack at the the death of professionalism in that. Uh, having said that, there's some really damn good book bloggers out there who write really good reviews. So hey, um, uh, as long as as long as people can are still you know care enough about books to write about them in 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 the fullness of everything, that's a good thing. Now, Keith, looking ahead, can you? Talk to us about some of your, your future projects. Will you see any of the uh, protagonists from uh, Animal again? Uh, right now, series? Dr. Batra and I are talking about uh, what to do in a sequel to Animal. Um, we're, still, we're still working on, on how to make that work. I mean, we set it up in such a way that, that, that it's open. Look, you will see that the ending is, is left... It's pretty obvious what the pathway is, at least in general, toward a sequel. Uh, it's the pathway in specific that we're still working out the details of. Um, but we're, we're, we're in the process of, of talking about that. Um, and our second collaboration, which is, uh, like I said, a medical thriller, is currently with our agent and waiting for his... Um, more, uh, more directly, uh, let's see. This year, I sh uh, I've got a... Um, a uh, short story coming out in an anthology called Horns and Halos, which is half stories about angels, half stories about demons. Uh, I wrote one of the angel stories, which is called Unguarded. And uh, I've got a novella that will be coming out as part of a series called Systema Paradoxa, which is about cryptids. Um, I'm going to be writing, the, I believe, the fourth volume in the series, uh, which is entitled All the Way House. Um, and that will be out, I believe, in the summer. Uh, I'm currently working on the second book in my urban fantasy series about a guy from the Bronx who hunts monsters for a living, uh, the Brown Gold Adventures. Uh, the first book was called A Furnace Sealed and is currently available from Wordfire Press. The second book is called Feet of Clay, Feet spelled F-E-A-T, um, and it has uh, Brom, who is a super, like I said, a supernatural hunter for hire, who is has to chase down a golem that has been animated as well as deal with a dragon that is uh, getting in somebody's backyard on uh, that one. And, uh, since I was there. <laughs> the the series was actually inspired by working for the census in twenty ten. Uh, I worked for the I worked as a crew leader in the sense for the U.S. Census Bureau when, uh, when we did the decennial census uh, eleven years ago, and um, and I got to see a lot of the Bronx. Uh, I mean, I've lived here most of my life, but there were parts of it I'd never been to, uh, and I got to see them while working for them. And my wife did the same last year. And uh, it was very enlightening and inspired me to want to write. Because everybody, when they write about New York, they always write about Manhattan. Uh, and it's usually just Manhattan south of 125th Street. If they want to be really edgy, maybe they'll write about Brooklyn. But uh, Upper Manhattan, Queens, the Bronx, Staten Island are all completely ignored. And uh, I, like I said, I've lived in the Bronx most of my life, and I think we deserve a little more love. Than so that's what this series is about. I'm also working on the next book in my Precinct series, which is... Um, that's the fantasy police procedural I mentioned. Uh, there are five novels in the series, Dragon Precinct, Unicorn Precinct, Goblin Precinct, Griffin Precinct, Mermaid Precinct. The next book will be called Phoenix Precinct. 
Uh, and it's about two detectives uh, who live in a... In a it's, it's your standard fantasy setting, straight out of Tolkien or Dungeons and Dragons. Humans and elves and dwarves and magic and wizards and stuff like that. But the main characters are two detectives who solve crimes. Um, and uh, that, the, like I said, I'm working on Phoenix Precinct right now. Uh, there's some other stuff I have in the hopper, including a comic book that I can't talk about yet. It hasn't been formally announced. But um, we're hoping to have that out, I think, in the late summer, early fall. That'll be a really cool project that I hope to talk about. <laughs> sounds, sounds, sounds like you're very, very busy. I have to be. If, I'm, if, I, if I stop working, they stop paying me. Um, they, I'm also writing, as I mentioned, I was writing for Tor.com. I'm currently doing a Star Trek Voyager rewatch. Uh, I've been rewatching each episode of Star Trek Voyager. I've already done the same for the original series, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine. Um, and now I'm doing Voyager. Uh, after this, I'm going to do Star Trek Enterprise. And I've also been reviewing each episode of the new uh, Star Trek stories as they come out, episodes as they come out, of Discovery, of Picard, of Lower Decks, Star Trek. And I'll be continuing that with those as, as they're released. Uh, I've also been doing, I did a feature for them called uh, Four Color to 35 Millimeter, the great superhero movie rewind, uh, where I reviewed every single live action movie based on a superhero comic. Uh, eventually I caught up to real time, but every six months or so I'm going to be revisiting that. Uh, since there doesn't look like those movies are going to be slowing down anytime soon. Uh, even, even with a lot of delays uh, because of the current apocalypse, there were still uh, when, there were still four movies released that qualified for that rewatch, and there will be more next year. And, and... When, when do you sleep? I'm sorry, what is that? Sleep? When, when, do, when do you sleep? I'm, I'm not familiar with that concept. But <laughs> is, is, that, is that a thing that people do? Some of us try to. But my doctor encourages it for me in my case. <laughs> and I'm still training in karate. I take classes, you know, three, four times a week. Uh, still occasionally teaching. Good. Good. Well, well Keith, that, that's certainly a, uh, a great review of your, your life, your writing, uh, Animal, and what your future projects are. I'd just like to turn it over to the audience now, if there's any questions out there from anyone for a few minutes before we end. And we're going to have to end at... Uh, uh, <clears throat> seven o'clock because we lose our camera person at that at that time. But uh, for you folks in the audience, any uh, questions here for uh, Keith? I would also um, mention while we're waiting for a question that I also have a YouTube channel where I've been reading my short fiction called Crad COVID Readings, which I started obviously. Excellent. Excellent. So, any uh, questions from uh, anybody out there in the audience for uh, Keith tonight? Going once, going twice. Okay, well, if not then, let me just check on the comments over here. Oh, got a question from a uh, member of the audience. What, what inspires you, Keith? Oh, uh, what doesn't inspire me? I mean, I, the, <laughs> uh, I, I take inspiration from everywhere. Like I said, the, the uh, perfect example is the Urban Fantasy series. That came from just, you know, wandering around the Bronx for months on end in 20. Um, the, uh, the Precinct series came out of just a love of both those genres, uh, a love of epic fantasy that goes back to reading The Hobbit as a kid, and a love of police procedurals that go, goes back to watching Barney Miller and Hill Street Blues as a kid. Um, and, and putting that chocolate with that peanut butter was very compelling to me. Um, I have a series of short stories that take place in Key West, also urban fantasy stories, starring a young woman, Cassie Zukov. That came out of visiting Key West and falling in love with it. Um, and I thought, this would be a great place to set short stories. And so I've written, you know, 20 short stories in that setting. Um, uh, you know, the, the one, of, one of arguably my uh, Star Trek novel um, was a, a novel called The Art of the Impossible, which uh, chronicled something called the Patrika Nebula incident. It was mentioned briefly in an episode of... Uh, we only knew like three things about it, uh, and based on that 30-second conversation on a Deep Space Nine episode, I built out a 100,000-word novel, which was this sprawling political that spanned 18 years of history. Um, sometimes, you know, the idea comes from an editor coming up to me and saying, hey, I want you to write this book. Um, that in particular with the, with, the, with the license fiction, you know, uh, Star Trek novels and the Supernatural novels. and um, oh, we're good. Yeah, you know, there's there's nowhere it doesn't come from. 
that's very good. It's just, I, I guess if you, if you stop and look around you, you're going to find a, a lot of ideas for uh, what you want. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, well. My favorite, my oh. favorite. I want to do one, one quick one. There was a Please. Zorro short story I wrote about 10 years ago, and I got the ball rolling on it. It was, it was a, a character saying something to Zorro, saying, while your mask frees you, my rank shackles me. The whole story came out of that. I can see we need a good story from that line. Okay, everybody. Well, I want to first. I want to thank uh, Keith for joining us this evening uh, and participating here on the uh, on the broadcast. Um, I'd just like to uh, tell everybody out there in the audience that well, please feel free to contact me at conpsweeney at sabetti com if you have any suggestions for panelists, ideas for shows, or if you wish to participate yourself. I'm wondering if putting on a show like this isn't easy. If you'd like to volunteer to help out on our stage crew, please let us know. Uh, we're getting ready our guest for February 2021, so stay tuned. We'll be announcing her shortly. Uh, thank all of you for joining us, and we'll see you again next month. Keith, thank you very much, and everyone, take care. Thank you. We'll end the broadcast now. Thank you. Bye-bye.